Uh, thanks, Rohit, for joining us here in Bali, APMF. Uh, yeah, you're welcome. This is uh, this is your first time in Bali speaking, right? First time speaking. Uh, I've only ever come here for a holiday, so it was a little odd being on the plane and having everyone else ready for vacation. And, and being not here me. and not going to the beach. I know it's yeah. uh, it's uh, it's strange. So um, you're going to be speaking later today about uh, about about trends and and, and how that um, uh, you know how that whole. Uh, the idea of being able to uncover trends before they're actually trends, right? So um, previously you were kind of in the marketing and advertising industry. So what drove you to kind of spin off and, and, and kind of really focus on uh, what is a trend and how to, how to discover these things? Yeah, I used to spend a lot of time, uh, actually it was through frustration, which I think is what a lot of entrepreneurs uh, end up starting something based on frustration. And for me, the frustration was that I would see a lot of people talking about what they called trends, and I found it to be like totally obvious. So you were like, yeah, and I was like, this is not a trend. trend. Yeah, because they would post like uh, five years ago, they say the biggest trend right now is Facebook. <laughs> I'm like, that's not a trend. That's just something that exists. Um, you can't say the biggest trend is 3D printing because people are interested in 3D printing. Like, that's not a trend. A trend has to be a behavior. Um, and so I started thinking about that, and then I started writing about it in like blog posts, and then I turned them into presentations, and then people started like looking at them and sharing them. And eventually, I turned it into a book, um, and that was in 2015, the first book version of it. And then every year, I started doing a new version of it. I started updating the book, and that's kind of how it started. Yeah, my first book was actually called uh, Personality Not Included, and it was all about why I felt like brands need to have a personality, to be human, um, to be authentic, and this was now 10 years ago, so it seems like a really long time. Uh, but a lot of the message um, was based on what was sort of happening in social media, like brands were trying to be more authentic, they wanted to sort of show that there were real people behind these brands, but they didn't know how to do it. But were they, so, so, so you're saying back then is uh, brands were trying to build a personality, but it was kind of, kind of forced? You know, it was, it was based like, on a be campaign. It was like, yeah, it was like, let's have a personality in this campaign not let's actually have a personality. And it was just like, it's like deciding to like fake an accent when you go to a networking event. That's basically what they were doing. Uh, it wasn't real. And, and uh, you know, do you feel that people could kind of see through that uh, they totally relatively did. quickly? Yeah, they totally yeah. did. Um, and, and how have things changed? You know, they, you wrote this 10 years ago. And do you feel that a lot of brands are, are, uh, are looking at it uh, in a lot different way? Um, are, are they kind of really uh, adopting the, this, this idea of personality? I would love to tell you that it's like totally changed. Um, but I think that the brands still struggle with this because the bigger you are, the harder it is to reconnect with those people, like the, the authentic sort of beginnings of a lot of these things. And so I think that uh, what a lot of brands struggle with is, okay, we want to have a personality, we want to be authentic, but we don't want our people to talk for us because that has to be approved by someone. And the challenge is as soon as you start adding in those layers, now you're having people review things that you want to say, whose job it is to make sure you don't actually say anything. And lovely, so you end up saying nothing. It's legal department. Right. Sorry, sometimes it's the legal, legal department. department. Sometimes it's the you know, corporate leaders. I mean, when, when you're, if your goal is to say something authentic, then you'll say something authentic. If your goal is to maintain your job and not say anything, then you'll say something inauthentic. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just kind of what happens. And so, so do you think? Do you think that that's also the reason why uh, a lot of the brands that do kind of showcase authenticity are the younger ones that haven't been around for a while because you know it's a bit of a cleaner slate, uh, and there's not the kind of baggage, if you will, of uh, of what that brand has been for ten years, twenty years, forty years that they need to now uh, change. Sometimes it's based on like, okay, you're a new brand, but really, really quickly. Um, new brands can fall into the same habits. So I don't believe that it's like a, if your brand's been around for a long time, you struggle with this. And if you're like a new startup, you don't. Um, I think it's a mentality. And I think that one of the biggest challenges is that when a company doesn't trust its people to speak on behalf of the company, you end up with this stuff. How did you, how did you start off with the, uh, the trend series? So the trend series was um, me thinking about uh, I'd been doing this trend report, and I started thinking, am I one of these futurist guys who does all this research and tells you what the trends are? 
or do I believe that this process that I'm using is something anyone can do? And my answer to that was I think anyone can do this. And so I wanted to write a book not only about here are what the trends are, but also like if you wanted to learn to think in this way, if you wanted to think in a non-obvious way, what would that be? What would that mean? And if you could do that, then you could start to like think about the future and predict the future for yourself. And that's what inspired me to write the book. And, uh, and how often, uh, you know, I, there's a new one that comes out every, uh, every year, right? Um, a new updated, uh, updated version. Um, uh, what is it that you do and where do you, where do you draw inspiration to kind of go out and find these trends? Uh, I think that a lot of what I do is I find ideas. So I'm curating ideas, I'm looking for like what's the, what's the interesting thing that's happening right now and how does that relate to something else that's happening somewhere else in another country, in another industry. And I'm drawing these patterns, these connections. And if you think about the idea of like assembling a puzzle, like a jigsaw puzzle, easy to say, okay, you just find the pieces and put the puzzles together. But what if like every piece was from a different puzzle? And then you started to put them together. And if you found the exact right pieces, if you put them together in such a way that you could create something totally new, that's what I think some of this, the, the art behind this is. Because the insight comes from finding these unexpected relationships between these things. And that's where a lot of these, these things come from that make it non-obvious instead of perfectly obvious. You know, one of the things that you've touched upon in, uh, in, in, in your previous talks and your research is uh, what, you've, what you've called the believability crisis. What is that? Yeah, the believability crisis for me is the idea that with so much more media and so many more people who are getting really good at manipulating that media, uh, it becomes harder to be trustworthy for everybody. And so the believability crisis is this idea that it's harder to be believable, to pass that barrier as a brand or as an individual than it ever has been before. And so we have to start to understand why that is and how do we rise above it? What do we do to be more believable? Because this is urgent for all of us, whether we're trying to persuade someone to hire us in a job or whether we're trying to sell something you know, as a brand. Uh, this is a big, big question. And when, and you know, um, what do you feel has been the, the the catalyst, if you will, of that believability, believability crisis becoming, you know, what it is? In in, in that, uh, it's becoming a lot harder to uh, to to know what is true and what isn't. Uh, I think it's been uh, empowerment on both sides. So, we as individuals are empowered because we can get information on everything. So we can validate anything anyone tells us because we can just go and Google it. Right? So information's at our fingertips, which empowers us. On the flip side, anyone who's trying to tell you something is empowered with more channels and more things that they can use to tell you that. So they're empowered with the technology as well. Anybody can be a video creator, they can create their own film style video and then post it. And so when you have both of those things, what ends up happening is nobody really knows what is real and what's authentic and what is right to trust and what isn't because it's so easy to manipulate. And so then, so then, you know, so then what do brands need to do in order to, to overcome that? Well, I think one uh, thing that, that more brands should focus on doing is trying to put the people behind what they're doing more front and center. And I think, you know, Gojek is a great example of doing that because you're taking the people who are behind the company, the drivers who are doing all these awesome things, and you're putting them front and center saying, look, here's what this guy's doing, and here's all the people that he's helping because he opened the school that helps this many people, right? And so when people see examples like that that are real in the community, that doesn't feel like a um, poster. You know, that doesn't feel like a marketing message. That feels like, yeah, this is what's actually happening. And I think that's how you bring these things to life, right? The brands that are bringing those types of things to life, they're putting their people front and center, those are the ones that are becoming more believable. You know, what are some of the, uh, what are some of the trends, not to like, you know, be a spoiler on, uh, on, on, yeah. on the book, right? <laughs> but, uh, but what are some of the trends that, that you've been seeing over the last, uh, last couple of months, other than, you know, data breaches and... Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> I call it, um, in the book, I call it data pollution. Data pollution. Um, yeah, which is exactly what it sounds like. I mean, you know, we have so much data that it's basically become pollution. And uh, we don't know what to pay attention to. And so, you know, the response to data pollution is the same thing that you see across the world. In some places, they pretend it doesn't exist. In some places, they, you know, um, find like weird technological ways of like filtering it out. Some places it's working, some places it isn't. Um, so yeah, you see that a lot with the data side. Um, 
think another trend uh, that I've written quite a lot about is what I call disruptive distribution. And that's about the way that we get products and services and the way that products and services are sold is fundamentally shifting. Mm -hmm. So everything from like banks opening cafes uh, to the way that you purchase uh, certain products changing. So if you think about like if you're a designer and you buy Photoshop and now you pay monthly for that, you don't yeah. buy it anymore. Yeah. yeah, and a lot of people think that, you know, in automotive, like that's the direction that it's going to go to where you just pay a monthly fee, you get the car, the insurance, everything you need, and then you can just switch the car for a different car whenever you want. And so if you think about that now, if you're an automaker, um, why would you have... Ford and GM have been looking into this. Uh, yeah, into this Volvo already. just did a pilot with that too, yeah. Um, and so the idea is, okay, if I subscribe to Volvo or BMW, right, in one month I might want a sedan, in another month I might want a bigger SUV. Um, what I don't probably need is three different sedans anymore because I don't need access to all of those, I just pick one. So how does that change their roadmap of what cars they make, right? If they're now selling a BMW subscription instead of 12 different cars. Um, what brands have you seen that have actually done, um, done something, uh, not just from a marketing perspective, but um, added a bit of a positive social impact on, uh, on, the, on the types of information that they're finding out from, uh, from, from their customers? Um, so the positive side of, of data, right, because we hear a lot about the negative side of data. Um, I'd say one positive side of, of data is how it can be used to figure out what people are actually really interested in. And what ends up happening is I think more important content, for example, can be made um, because you know that there's an audience for it. So if you think about what Netflix has done with their original production studio, so now they have hundreds of different productions that they're launching and putting out there, and they predictably know that there's an audience for it because they know what else someone has watched. That's why, that's why sometimes you look at them and they're like, what the hell is this? But somebody's, somebody's got to be watching it, right? Yeah, and it, it really does um, segment people into like what they're going to be most interested in. Now, it's bad if they only watch that and nothing else. But the thing is right now, Netflix has such a broad audience and they're making such widely different content that it allows for content creators who maybe wouldn't have ordinarily gotten the movie deal, right? Who wouldn't yeah. have had their things um, been produced. able to be made or be produced, exactly. It gives them a shot to be able to do that. And so there's all these content creators, and I know some of them, right? They're friends of mine who have struggled for years to find like the funding to get these things made. And now with Netflix and these studios, like they have a chance to get some of these things made. And that's really... Was, I mean, the this, this, this stuff, you're absolutely right. And, and uh, you know, the stuff that they've been managing to, to, to produce, obviously it's not cheap. They're spending, what, five, six, seven billion dollars a year on content. Right. Um, but there's a lot of increase in subscriptions based on the, the stuff that people want to watch. Yeah, and they have the pool, they have the pool of money, right? And, um, and if you think about it from a consumer point of view, it's a totally better experience. You don't have to worry about commercials. Yeah. You don't have to sit through this stuff. Everything's available for you for free. Yeah. If you travel a lot like you and I do, you can download these things. You don't have to be connected even to watch them, which makes it a much better consumer experience. And you can decide on whether you want to kind of ration it out a little bit or if you yeah. just want to binge and, uh, and you know, take right. it. Right. Yeah. yeah, fantastic. Well, thanks so much. Uh, looking forward to seeing, uh, seeing the keynote today and, uh, and maybe uh, come down to visit to Jakarta sometimes and uh, take a ride on a Gojek. Yeah, I will. I'll get the app. Thank you.